let's talk about Catacil. So this is a disease that I'm glad that they abbreviated. It's cerebral autosomal dominant arteriopathy with subcortical infarcts and leukoencephalopathy. The disease kind of tells you what it does. So it is a autosomal dominant disease. It's a arteriopathy. And because of that arteriopathy, it will cause subcortical infarcts and leukoencephalopathy. Probably the most commonly tested concept about Catacil is its genetics. So it's caused by mutations in the NOTCH3 gene on chromosome 19. And most commonly, these are missense mutations. What does NOTCH3 do? It encodes a transmembrane protein that's expressed in vascular smooth muscle cells. And in the disease, the extracellular domain accumulates in the disease, and that's what causes the uh, angiopathy in the small arteries, arterioles, and capillaries. Uh, this will also cause disruption of the blood-brain barrier. So in most patients with the disease, and especially on a question stem, they will have a family history of early strokes or dementia. For the clinical features, uh, patients are normally asymptomatic as children, and then as they become young adults and middle-aged adults, they'll start having symptoms. So migraine with aura that can present in their 20s or 30s. Uh, ischemic strokes and transient ischemic attacks are the most common symptom and they present earlier than when most people would start having strokes. So maybe in someone's 40s or 50s they'll present with the, with the stroke and they'll present with lacunar symptoms. So it could be pure sensory deficit, pure motor deficit, uh, ataxic hemiparesis, or dysarthria clumsy hand syndrome. And these strokes can be recurrent and lead to vascular dementia. Because of that, there's a lot of uh, patients with cognitive impairment and dementia. Some less common clinical features that you can see are mood disorders and pseudobulbar affect. There's one unique symptom uh, called acute reversible encephalopathy where someone presents with impaired consciousness, visual hallucinations, seizures, focal neurologic symptoms, and they usually completely recover within one to three months. And a lot of the times imaging is done for this and they're eventually diagnosed with the disease. Um, other less common features are seizures and spinal cord pathologies. So imaging is very important because it's what usually leads to the diagnosis. An MRI brain is more sensitive than a CT of the head. Uh, all of the findings will present uh, by age 35, and they can have kind of two main findings. So one, they'll have small circumscribed regions in the subcortical uh, regions that are isointense to CSF on T1 and T2 weighted images, so such as what this arrow is pointing to. And they can also have T2 hyperintensities that are subcortical again. So they're kind of around here and here and here and here. And one unique feature is that the anterior temporal lobe is commonly involved, which makes it a little different from a small vessel disease. So in terms of the diagnosis, it's based on clinical history, which uh, often they'll have a family history. And once the clinical history, uh, once you suspect that the patient has the diagnosis and you do imaging, then eventually you can confirm the disease with genetic analysis uh, that's consistent with the NOTS3 mutation. If you have high suspicion, but the genetic analysis is negative, then a skin biopsy will also have some characteristic findings in, on pathology and on electron microscopy that can lead to the diagnosis. In terms of treatment, there's no disease modifying agent. Uh, however, for the strokes, you'll treat them with secondary prevention, the same as for uh, other ischemic strokes. Uh, for mood disorders and pseudobulbar affect, you can treat them with SSRIs. And 
uh, the asymptomatic family members of people with catasil can receive genetic counseling as well when they're adults. In terms of the prognosis, the typical course of the disease can start with someone having migraines in their 30s and then progressing to ischemic strokes and mood disorders in their 40s to 60s and then eventually dementia in their 50s and 60s. Uh, people with the disease also tend to have a shorter lifespan. They may live till their 60s or early 70s.